Um, my name is Mandy Joy. I'm an oceanographer from the University of Georgia. And the title of this panel is Every Breath You Take, Two or Three Come From the Sea. Um, I'll be the moderator. Um, Britt Basil from Ecothropic is on the panel. Luis Ahoyas from the Oceanic Preservation Society. And Albert Slapp um, from Coastal Risk Communications. So um, this is a, a better title for the panel, I think. Healthy Oceans Matter. Um, and this is a little bit of a, a a take on the slide that, that Greg just showed that I didn't know he was going to show. Um, but but the, the four of us are going to talk about natural systems and, and the ocean as, as it responds to climate perturbations and how human systems uh, respond to, to perturbations um, due to climate related to particularly coastal communities and communities that are being impacted by rising sea level. So, you know, in terms of, of every breath you take, um, I think it's really fascinating that people, most people don't understand the role of the oceans in oxygen production. Um, when you Google ocean ecosystem services, as I did last night for, for KICS, um, these five things come up. Um, food production, coastal protection, water purification, carbon sequestration, and tourism and recreation. Um, the, the big missing thing is obviously oxygen. Oxygen doesn't come up in a Google search, um, and I did multiple iterations of that. Um, the, the oceans produce somewhere in the order of 50 to 65 percent of the oxygen um, that's produced globally. And that oxygen is, is produced by phytoplankton, which you've heard a little bit about, um, but also by ice algae, algae that live under ice in the polar regions of the ocean. That actually is an enormously important component of production in the oceans um, that is, is completely um, not known about by most people. Um, seagrasses, which occur in coastal regions and shallow water, and coral reefs, as you, as you all obviously know. All of these components of the system in the ocean that produce oxygen are, are in trouble because of, of a variety of reasons. And um, Carl talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, Greg didn't touch on it a little, but I wanted to, to, to talk about it just very briefly before we start the panel discussion. These are some of what I call the ocean's five alarm fires. Um, warming is a, is a critical problem, um, not just because of, of coral, reach, coral, coral bleaching and, and, and all the associated issues with that, but because many organisms in the ocean are adapted to a very narrow temperature regime. And if you take those organisms out of their temperature regime, just like corals, they, they, can't do, they can't do their job. And changes are happening so fast with respect to both warming and acidification in the ocean that evolution of these organisms doesn't, have a, doesn't stand a chance of keeping up. So things are changing so fast that organisms can't adapt, so they're going extinct. We have sea level rise, which we're going to hear a lot about. Um, overfishing, which is a huge problem. Um, Carl touched on that yesterday. At the end, if we have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing on how basically restoring ocean fisheries can, can do a lot for the oceans and a lot for climate. Um, we'll hear a lot about development and habitat destruction and the role that smart development uh, can, can have in, in protecting and, and making coastal communities more resilient. And then finally, some of the big issues that are resulting from ocean um, loss in the oceans, pollution, eutrophication, or driving coastal zones that are an anoxic. This picture at the bottom is, is the Mississippi River dead zone, which most of you may have heard about. Um, this is typically on the size of Rhode Island or Connecticut, just for scale. Um, this year's dead zone is predicted to be the third largest in the past 50 years, um, somewhere on the order of 25,000 kilometers squared. That's huge. Um, and, and this is driven by agricultural fertilizer use in the Midwest. Okay? This is not a Louisiana problem. This is driven by food production in the Midwest and overuse of fertilizer because of subsidies uh, to farmers. Um, oxygen depletion doesn't just happen in the coastal zones. It happens in the middle of the ocean. There are these oxygen minimum zones in the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. Every ocean basin has, has an oxygen minimum zone. Some of them are so low that animals can't survive in those areas. The Indian Ocean is a good example of that. And finally, Greg touched upon this, loss of biodiversity and function. This is really, really important because we have explored such a trivial amount of the ocean. You know, Greg, Greg mentioned that we know more about the surface of Venus and Mars than we do uh, than about the seafloor. 5% uh, of the seafloor has been explored, roughly. Um, and, the, and the amazing thing is that for the past 10 years, you can't get money from the federal government to explore the deep ocean. You know why? Because it's too risky. You might not get a nature paper out of it. So federal agencies don't want to pay for exploration. So if you made a map, 
which I did recently, I should have showed that, of all the places that submarines have gone in the ocean, what you see is that they go to the same place over and over again because they're still learning something, but they know they're going to learn something. So we, we really need to explore these areas before we can understand them because you know, there's biodiversity out there that's going to be gone before we even knew it existed, and that biodiversity, those organisms could have genes that are proteins or molecules that could cure cancer that we don't even know about. So um, Louis is going to talk a lot about this, I think, uh, when, he, when he talks about engagement of people, and a lot of people have touched on this. But I think um, in terms of the ocean, everybody has a connection to water. Everybody has a connection to the ocean. This is a quote um, from Jacques Cousteau, which many of you have probably heard before. People protect what they love. Um, I teach a class, an undergraduate class, on oceans and peril. And when I ask the kids in that class, you know, what's the most important thing to them, um, they don't say, uh, protecting the oceans. They don't say protecting the environments. They say getting rich. That's what's important to them. Money is important. Um, we have become so disconnected from the natural world that we've sort of lost our bearings. And I think reconnecting people with nature, especially the ocean, um, educating them fosters emotion. That emotion fosters connection, stewardship, and engagement. And engagement can drive change. When you have people really compelled to act, um, they're going to push their representatives in Congress to do something. So with that, I'm going to first turn it over to, to Albert. Um, I'll ask each of the panelists to, to briefly give a little introduction of, of what you do and who you are um, before you, you show your, your movie. So you can give your little introduction, and then they'll start your movie. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, Chip, for in inviting me uh, here uh, this year. Uh, my name's Albert Slapp, and I'm president of Coastal Risk Consulting. Uh, we're a technology company uh, located in Fort Lauderdale um, that our mission is to help a billion coastal residents around the world get climate ready and storm safe. So uh, with that, we're going to see a little film clip, and then I'm going to go over a few slides. This film clip is about some work we did down in Norfolk it's actually an outtake of Roger and Steve's film, A Tidewater, which you're all going to get to see the, the whole film tomorrow. Uh, I hope you all attend that. You will not see this clip because, as I said, it's an outtake. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting. So can we cue up the, um, the clip? This is the Ghent section of Norfolk. We are surrounded by beautiful stately old homes. This church was built between 1909 and 1910. It has a basement where we do have some facilities, but we are in the process of abandoning those because of ongoing water intrusion. And so when we have an unusually high tide or a storm out at sea or a storm here or a lot of rain, the water comes up through the storm drains and floods outside along the street. There's been many a Sunday morning where I've had to send out to the parish photographs of where the flooding is and guidance for people where they might park so that they don't get caught in the flooding. It's a great pleasure to meet with Albert Slapp from Coastal Risk Consulting, who's done an analysis of Christ in St. Luke's and the risks for flooding over the next number of decades. One of the things that I've really appreciated about reading this report is that for $100, it has the opportunity of empowering not only a church like ours, but, but the average homeowner in looking at how he or she can take preventive measures in the face of sea level rise. To one square meter, we're going to get resilient. What Albert and his company is doing is really exciting to us because what we do in this church over the next 10 years, we want to have an impact that lasts a century. And so we have to know what is the impact and how must we participate in preserving these beautiful historic buildings. So we have a, 
a floody coastal here and now. And just to give you some statistics from NOAA, uh, in the last 50 years, uh, coastal flooding, and I'm not talking about storms and storm surge and hurricanes, but I'm talking about seawater, ocean water coming over the land surface. Uh, in the last 50 years in Annapolis, Maryland, we've had 925% increase. In Baltimore, 922. Atlantic City, 682. Uh, Philadelphia, Sandy Hook, uh, in the five, six hundred percent. And this is what many people in the coastal areas, Savannah, uh, Charleston, um, Miami Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Atlantic City, et cetera. This is not due to a storm. This is what some people call sunny day flooding or king tide flooding. So they have fish in their driveway. And this is not an amenity. This is not something that increases, this doesn't increase the value of your home. And the question is, is there a climate resilient coastal future? You have architects, visionaries who, uh, you know, take a look at Venice and then they roll it forward to 2100 and they say, yes, people are going to live on the coast. Yes, it's going to be different than it is today. But the question is, how do we get from here to here? And, and I understand that we've been talking about uh, the future of the natural systems. And on this panel, we're going to talk about the future of the natural systems. But we also have to look at what we are doing to the oceans and how it is affecting us. So one of the things that we as a company believe is that we have to provide actionable data and analytics to a billion coastal residents to be able, for them to be able to understand better how they and their communities can re remain intact for as long as possible because most of these people don't have the money or the resources to retreat. Retreat is going to have to happen in certain areas, but it's not an option for everybody. It's like saying, uh, I don't know, uh, Mandy and I were talking about like, well, with the cutbacks in Medicaid, why, why give poor people Medicaid? They're gonna die anyway. You know, why help coastal communities because in 2100 sea levels are gonna rise by six feet? It's a waste of money. That's not really a, a good option and that's not how it's gonna play out. So anybody who really says that, and there are plenty of people who says that, say that, are really not thinking clearly about the pain and suffering that it's going to cause. So there are going to be real-time applications. There are going to be ways uh, to smarter cities to enable us to live longer with a wetter coastal environment. And this is not just a South Florida issue. It's happening all over. Um, and what we're trying to do is provide technology, even on smartphones, uh, to allow most, most people in the world are going to have access to, if not have a GPS-enabled smartphone, and they're going to be able to get uh, beam to that phone information, both in a planning sense and in a real-time sense. So this was last November, and I'm going to you know, wrap up in a minute, but this is a parking garage, a ground floor parking garage in Miami Beach, and an octopus swam into the parking garage. Poor little guy, someone put him in a bucket and dumped him back in the bay. But that's what's happening. It's not a dystopic future that, oh, well, 2100, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's happening now, and we have to, and we have to deal with it. And, we, and there are cost-effective things that individual homeowners can do, and there's things that new products of pop-up, removable, uh, retractable flood barriers that can protect buildings both from storm surge and from coastal flooding. And that's just what's going to happen. So with that, I'm... I'm pretty much going to turn it over um, to Brit, Brit. to Brit. Up next. Okay, and you can um, swap with with Brit's materials. Thank you. All right. So while they're switching it over, 
My name is Britt Basil. I have an organization called Ecothropic, and I work at the, inter in the intersection between climate change adaptation with traditional communities, primarily in the South Pacific. Most of my work is between the South Pacific, Cuba, and the South of Mexico. And I also work with the university students, engaging them with those issues, and I'm a storyteller. So I want to bring in the voice of other people around the world. OK, on this slide, you would see the village of Buma in the Solomon Islands. And so, well, like I was saying, well, I want to bring in the voice of the other people around the world and what they're experiencing, what they can do about it, and what they are doing about it. So the village that you didn't see is located in the Solomon Islands, which, to orient you, is in Melanesia. It's to the northeast of Australia. And even as we sit here, life's also happening there. So that's Krista's son playing soccer. That's Donna's son jumping in the water. The way we arrived at Boom was on a private boat. It's a 30-hour sail from the provincial capital, and the only other way to get there is on a cargo ship that takes, that, well, there's only one cargo ship every two months. So as a result, these people are pretty much entirely on their own. There's no market economy. There are no stores. They rely almost entirely on the food they can produce and on their traditional agricultural systems and what they can catch from the surrounding sea those same fisheries that we're talking about that are being so heavily impacted. So let's talk about poverty for a second. There's a lot of debate on exactly what poverty means. But for our purposes, I'm going to turn to Oppenheim. And he proposed it's about rights and relationships, about how people are treated and how they regard themselves, about powerlessness, exclusion, and loss of dignity. Absolute poverty is when people fall below this level, when they cannot house, clothe, or feed themselves. House, clothe, or feed themselves. So from my experiences, these people aren't poor. But how does climate change factor in? Just to highlight a couple of impacts, increased storm surge means just ruined fruit trees and destroyed homes. Changing rains means stunted crops, meaning less food. And what about the challenges to our oceans like Mandy outlined for us? Well, all of these issues mean compromised fisheries. And for coastal peoples around the world, this means compromised income, food, and jobs. But for the traditional village of Buma, compromised fisheries mean less protein. But it's not just about protein. It comes back to this pervasive theme about systems dynamics and it's a cascade effect. So just to give one example, compromised fisheries means less access to protein, which means that they now need money, which means they have to leave their village where they otherwise had everything they needed to go to the capital city of Honiara. But this migration can damage social networks and traditional knowledge and more. And these are exactly the factors that would otherwise help make the community resilient to challenges, including climate change. So I propose that when they stop being able to access the resources they need to live and thrive, that's when poverty comes into the equation. And that's when it becomes difficult to help themselves. And this is just one community. There are hundreds of millions of people that depend on close coastal resources that live in low-income countries. So where's the path forward? We need to build resilience in communities. We need to increase their ability to adapt to these challenges, because they're not going to change. We know that. But how do they deal in the best possible way with what's happening? How, do we, how are they as strong as possible in the face of what's happening? And the way that we can do that is working on the five capitals. So we have natural capital, supporting healthy local ecosystems, human capital, knowledge, and the physical capacity of people to do whatever needs to be done. Physical capital, infrastructure, and tools. Financial capital, sustainable livelihoods for financial resources so they can buy whatever they need. And sociopolitical capital, social networks that serve as insurance policies, and political clout to create policies that represent their interests. So on this next slide, I'm going to share with you a new approach that we're taking, that we're using film to engage youth with climate adaptation and connect them with their elders and traditional knowledge. 
So this builds up human, social, and natural capital, while also reducing pressure and dependence on marine resources. So this is 60% about the process and 40% about the product, and the intended audience are the communities themselves. And this is the first time anybody's seen it. This is the trailer. Yes, Blomi, 21 years old. And me, 21 years old. And me from Banyata. You come from Banyata. Banyata community. Yeah, One thing I love about my village is that uh, the way kids are playing in the evenings, and also the color of the beach. That's what I love most about my village. I want to know more about the uh, changes or the issues that you know happen in climate change. So for the changes by happen that but uh, strong winds, heavy rain, but still continue. The river so flood strong rumors. Can ban falan mukarin the places for stuff good lo lands. What do you mean looking this time here? Him no more awesome before or before him different from what you may look in this time? Yeah, him changed because he, time before, or what the old man is having, sabe, sabe, dating or what the time or what the season. But before, or what the season, yeah, but I was shooting time or what the for me for the must be ready. And that changes me looking before and now. Me, but I was feeling long body blow me. And me looking long iron blown. What na? Some for the young people from fixing up that changes. If I la or some youths me just encouraging me for the phone, not can cut them down any uh, trees or some people are looking for him useless, yeah? Because same in, important to myself what the trees the forest blow you me. All get uh, must no over harvest. All same, uh, take him little bit no more, you know, take him plant it. Him change and him make him life him hard this time, yeah? So advice for me now, him, for every young people, traditional knowledge now, him very, very important. When me think that the young people should understand it. Why a chief put him tambulo before? Him, important to us for what community looks at the law. Something we are by you mean for use him and what you mean keep him, you mean hold him, or you mean even go near. That one not I think by him helpful to us. Time you me got him less resources for survive along or climate change impact. If you use him for the things why me use him to the for farming. But a white man or the game come for you, yeah. Me look at him and destroy him too much, nah, ground for me. So, over something I'm important too much, let me be like talent, no, I must use him that traditional tools by me for planting. We all like to take him the old method of planting and try for repeating logistics of time where climate change impact. After time, I finish now, yeah, strong now, yeah. Strong now, yeah. But the people must look good, yeah? No kind of rough and no kind of rush, but the people must very respect how for doing good in the future time. We will never become a role model inside the community for me to set up good. I'm not hopeful next time for Banyata. So the first day that I was working with the youth, one of the questions is, who in your community do you know that can help us confront these issues? Who has the knowledge that we need? And Jason, who made that last comment, he said, you know, maybe in the old times our elders knew, knew what we needed, maybe they were smart, but the elders we have now, they just, they don't know anything, we're on our own. And it totally broke my heart. But the second to last day, he comes up to me and he says, hey Britt, do we have time for one more interview? 
And I said, well, yeah, why? And he said, we need to talk to my dad because he knows everything. So the goal of these films is to repeat the process all over the world in different cultures that are experiencing the same issues. And the idea is to change this dynamic instead of it being the white Western world that comes in with our solutions and our paradigm, that they can understand that there's this lateral network and solidarity that they can create to also look for solutions at that level. So communities like Buma and Baniatha and hundreds of millions of people are facing similar challenges and will continue to feel the effects of climate change. But armed with understanding of what we're all facing and planning for it in a way that can build up the five capitals, we can make their communities stronger in the face of climate change impacts, including the challenges to our oceans that our oceans are facing and create hope for the future. So now we'll hear from Louis. Can you queue up Louis's film? Or do you want to mm. say a few words first? Yeah, um, these are all big problems we're talking about. And you know, Chip Cummins, who organizes the conference here with Sally, they're always talking about the speed and scale that we need to have implemented to, to attack the problem. And I think about, this, as a filmmaker, I think about this a lot. You know, the, uh, how do you reach the optimum amount of people that you can uh, reach to, to create social change? And there actually is a number, you know, people, some people, you know, everybody's familiar with the Margaret Mead quote, you know, never doubt that a few thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing it ever has. But it, there's actually, you need to have those people activate 10%. The studies show that once you have 10% of a population, 100% uh, committed to an idea, the rest of the population follows. But if you don't reach that 10% level, it's like, it's like trying to create steam. You can't do it unless you boil water. 10% is the activation number. So we're always trying to think, how can we reach that number? What, I used to work for National Geographic. We had uh, 11 million people had the magazine. 50, 44 million people saw it because it had a four-person pass-around rate. You can reach that 10% level pretty quickly. Now we're all fragmented. We're not you know, reading the same magazines and articles and, and, and blogs. We're, we're very fragmented. Movies are, are pretty good about getting us on the same page, but those also tend to fall into silos. So what my organization, the Oceanic Preservation Society, has been doing is like, how do you get the world on the same page? So we can take, so we're not just talking to 100 people or a, a, couple, a couple tens of millions of people with a, with a movie. How do you reach billions of people, a billion people? And uh, uh, if you saw Racing Extinction, I just want to show you uh, w one clip of that if you haven't seen it. Um, for the end of the movie, we wanted to, I've been wanting to light up the Empire State Building for like four years. And people said it was crazy. Nobody would, you know, it would be too expensive. Uh, nobody would see it because on a weekend in the summer in New York, all the important people would be over in the Hamptons or over in Europe. Uh, media wouldn't show up because on Saturday night late when it starts to get, uh, it gets dark later, uh, the media couldn't show up because they couldn't pay for overtime. Uh, well, we had, 400, we had 939 million media views on this by Thursday. We were the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days. And this is about the world extinction crisis, but I'll just show you real, real quickly. It's just last a minute. In 200 years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish? But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we've been. Well, we, had, we thought we couldn't get any more, uh, get any, get any more uh, eyes on that issue uh, than you know, a, a billion people than uh, the Pope called. He wanted us to light up the, the Vatican with endangered species when leaders, world leaders were at, at, uh, uh, at Paris for COP21. I'll just show you a quick clip of that too. Thank you.
225,000 people showed up to watch it live, all of them with cell phones. billion media impressions within a week. Um, and then we, what we did with that was as we used the projections, we, we took them over to the, the west coast of the United States, and we used the, uh, the drive and the, and the inspiration that people were feeling to, to uh, work with other NGOs to, uh, to set up a west coast firewall, a legal firewall to prevent endangered species from entering the, the western coast of the United States from Asia. And so the, the, the November election was horrible for everybody in this room, but one thing it was good for for the environmental movement is Oregon became the last state to uh, present, prevent about 12 of the most endangered species from entering from Asia. But that was done because we, st we did projections that got a referendum on the ballot and got that, that West Coast firewall. So you can, we can turn these projections into action. Now, uh, what we're doing next is, we, um, I, I hope we're doing it next, we're, we should be hearing from the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations either today or tomorrow about uh, we want to drop a scrim on the Secretariat building. That's the, uh, the, the tall building that we, we if this is the, the UN, <laughs> we projected on the edge before. Now we want to drop a scrim over the entire face of it uh, during the General Assembly and project on it for three days. So we'll have like about 10 hours of content. And it'll also all be over Climate Week. So it'll be on the, US, uh, on the United Nations SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals. But it'll all be centered around climate change. Um, but I'll just, this is a, a quick uh, mock-up. And this comes from uh, uh, Chasing Corals showing tomorrow. I'm not sure what time it's in, but you should see this. Saturday, at Saturday. OK, thank you. And this is uh, from Jeff Rolowski's film, Chasing Coral. This is. Um, you see the Great Barrier Reef changing from, you know, going from live to dead. And uh, all the other projections we did would, uh, were all one-day events. We wanted to have this one a three-day event. And you can see we would dominate the New York skyline. The building on the far right that's just cropped off, that's Trump World Headquarters, by the way. So uh, th these projections are extremely expensive. I mean, you know, the, the people say, well, it's like, uh, you know, a million dollars to light up the Vatican or a million dollars to do the... Uh, uh, the Empire State Building, this will be, you know, three million because it's almost a million dollars for the scrim. People say, that's a lot of money. I say, well, you know, a Super Bowl com a commercial cost twice that it's for 30 seconds and you're selling beer. Here. So what we're trying to do is get... We, <laughs> we're, we're trying to... Uh, we, we've raised uh, a, a good chunk of the money. Um, Sally and, and Chip have been really good about connecting us to, the, to people about doing it, but we're, um, we have, I probably shouldn't say, but we have some, some Facebook money. They can't directly you know, say that they're doing it. But there's a, a lot of or, uh, individuals and organizations that see the importance of speaking to people at this, at this scale. Because you know, we had 4.4 billion media impressions on the, on the Vatican. That was just the, the English language. We, could, we weren't even doing tracking in Korea and Japan and, and China, where, these, where they were uh, putting it out there as well. So I know we can start to... With, with, and with 10 hours of content over three days, we can start talking about all these issues. And we'll talk about it, not just in the English language, we'll, we'll do it in the, the six languages of the UN, so that people feel like they're being spoken to all over the world. And another thing we've been able to do is, um, we work with Obscura Digital uh, in San Francisco. They've figured out a way to gamify this, so people can act, actually interact with the UN in real time. Of course, we'd have to have you know, the right controls so people aren't taking it over, but we can actually gamify it. Um, so that people have, you know, they can actually literally see their voice or hear their voice being heard. Um, anyway, that's, that's what we're up to. Okay, we have about seven and a half minutes left. We're going to open it up for questions in just a second, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to 
do a little 30 second closing pitch. And I'll, I'll start. So, so when you think about what you could do to save the ocean, to improve ocean health overnight, um, the, one of the biggest things that can improve ocean health instantly, and, and Carl touched on this yesterday, is restoring ocean fisheries. Because there's a massive carbon sequestration capacity that's been lost from the oceans because of the removal of big macrofauna, megafauna like whales, sharks, etc. cetera. Um, those large animals grow fast. They basically store a lot of carbon in their bodies. They live a long time. And when they die, they sink to the cold, dark, high pressure ocean floor, and they degrade really slowly. Um, we're talking about a carbon sequestration capacity that's on the same order of magnitude as current day anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Um, so this is not trivial. It's three or four times higher than terrestrial carbon sequestration. Um, and it's a, it's a real solution that combines ocean conservation uh, with, with sustainable climate uh, drivers. Um, if anybody would like to know more about that, I'm happy to talk about it later. But that's my, what I would do today if I could. Um, I'll pass and just give the audience more time take my 30 seconds. I'll, I'll take part of yours, Don. I'm just joking. Go, that's no, okay. but uh, you know, the, 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 the easiest thing that everybody could do to save the oceans and save the environment is adopt more of a plant-based diet. Just plant, just hands down, simple. So the biggest cause of ha habitat destruction, the biggest cause of, uh, the biggest use of, of fresh water, um, species lost because of habitat dest destruction. It's a, the, you know, eating animal protein is, is bad for your health, bad for the, the planet's health, and it's obviously bad for the, you know, 124,000 animals that die every minute because we have this myth that we need animal protein to be, you know, to satiate ourselves. So you can save the oceans three times a day by adopting more of a plant-based diet. Uh, I'll just keep it simple and say that I think the biggest issues are, especially for the communities I work with, are education and reducing the, the pressures and the dependence on marine resources and looking for other solutions and remembering that we're part of a global community that has many different faces. And we're aware of that, but it's very easy to lose sight of that in our day to day. So if we're looking for bridges and looking for that, bringing in those different voices as much as we can to the dialogue.